if Teams is wanting to cooperate. Um, there we go. So, Hannah, please do take it away. Yeah, uh, I will do. Perfect. So, thanks, thanks a lot, Chloe, for the introduction and uh, for having me at today's UCO session. Um, I'm really excited to talk about my PhD a bit. This is um, one component of what I'm working on for the PhD. And the talk is called Traversing Language Structures, Creating, Exploring and Visualizing Large Scale Linguistic Networks. I thought I'd give this talk um, because UCRA offers us a, a, a space where I can reasonably like, go into a bit of detail as well. And I'm really excited to see so many of you here today. So it's, it's really nice. Now, um, this is all a bit abstract and, and sounds a bit odd. So I'm based in corpus linguistics. This is what I've, I'd say I'm a corpus linguist by training. Um, the cycle of this we have a bit of a, an audio issue. I think it's fine now though. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we can hear you again. Okay, brilliant. Um, so I thought I'm, I, as I said, I'm a, a corpus linguist by training and I'm looking at corpus linguistics here, so text-based networks, but I'm also looking at psycholinguistic networks. So that's going to be the other big component uh, we'll talk about today. So the plan is the following. Um, first a little introduction as to what, what this is about, actually like what am I working with? Um, and then we're going to look, go into why this makes sense. So why would looking at large scale collocation networks give us anything? What does it do in terms of the like wider field? What's the context there? Why might it be useful? And what can't we use it for really? Um, then I'm going to go into some graph theoretical parameters. I tried to keep it as stats and maths free as possible. Uh, so I'm just going to give you some examples and show you some values. I won't really go into detail, but if there's any mathematicians in here or people who, who love stats a lot, um, I would love to chat to you as well and just post your questions in the chat or, or put them, ask them at the end. That'd be great. Um, I'd love to get feedback on this, and uh, but I try and keep it reasonably simple um, for the purposes of this talk while I'm talking. Then we're going to talk about potential applications. Again, if you're working in any of the fields I'm going to mention um, and you have an idea as to how you could potentially use what I'm talking about today, please do let me know. Just shoot me an email. I'm going to share my email address with you at the end as well. Um, or message me on Teams or on Twitter, wherever. Just get, get in touch if you have an idea as to how you could use this system. And I'd be quite happy to adapt some of the methodology for your purposes as well. So if you're interested in anything in particular and you think networks might help you, um, shoot me an email, let me know. All right, let's get started then. Um, what are we dealing with? What am I actually doing? All right, so I'm looking at network representations of, in simple terms of how the language we're surrounded by, the language we speak, versus large scale networks of the mental lexicon. So in a way, how we think or how these individual lexical items are connected in our head, so internally. And what I want to know is how similar and different are these two spheres? So how similar is the way we communicate to the way we conceptualize things? And where are the differences? And are there systematic differences that aren't immediately obvious? Um, so, for example, some people will know just by their own um, experience that they're not always thinking in entire sentences. It's not always perfectly spelled out, like as if you would write, I don't know, or as if you'd speak. Sometimes you just have an idea and it's just like a word or a fragment or a thought or something. So I think it's fair to say that we, we assume that there's some difference between these two systems, but what is this really? And can we maybe look into this using networks? So to tackle this, I thought it's probably a great idea to look at collocations. And in this specific instance, my definition of collocations is very broad. If you're working with other definitions of collocations, of course, they're all valid. I just, I sort of, 
combine all of these into one massive umbrella term. And as it usually happens, if you um, go well, more and more abstract over time, you will arrive at a very short, simple conclusion that covers a lot. Um, so for my purposes, collocations are simply words that systematically co-occur. That means words that co-occur more often than we think together or less often than we think. Um, so for some words, we would just by random chance, for example, imagine that they appear next to each other and they actually don't. And I'm also interested in this. So some words might have a sort of a distance between them. And broadly speaking, um, what I mean by this umbrella term is syntactic collocations, which are kind of a, a result of grammatical effects. Um, just imagine, I don't know if I, if I say, well, today's Thursday and the weather's nice, there's an, there's an and the in it, and this will happen a lot. In a lot of sentences, I have some form of and followed by the, um, and you could argue that this is a systematic co-occurrence. There's a system behind it. It's, it occurs more often than expected. Um, so I would assume that this is also a collocation. So that's sort of the lesser known type. And I'm also looking at lexicographic collocations, sort of the, the prototypical collocations, um, which would be something, for example, like White House, where you have a combination of two words and they make up a new instance of something. So they kind of make up a new um, meaning carrying unit almost. So if I say a White House, so as in any White House, that doesn't particularly mean a lot. It's just a house with the property of being white. Um, whereas if I say the White House, it's clear that I, I there's one specific house I'm referring to. Um, and this would also be called a collocation. So this will systematically co-occur, um, probably more often than red house or blue house, because it just has this added layer of meaning. Um, and this is also part of my definition of collocation. So on the one hand, in terms of the corpus side of things, I look at those and I look at these in the BNC 2014. Um, everything I'm presenting here is going to be based on the BNC 2014 Baby Plus because that's the version that's released already and that I can work with as is. The BNC 2014 is going to be released soon and then I'm going to be working with the full data set. But at the moment, I'm working with sort of the pilot study. It's still 5 million words, so it's reasonably well, depends what you're usually working with, but um, it's an okay size, it's not a tiny corpus. And um, I look at these systematic co-occurrences of words in the BNC 2014. So I look at those as sort of the underlying structure of the language we're presented with. Um, for, I, I, because I don't know what your background is and, and how much you know about the BNC itself, just a short, quick, um, uh, explanation of how this is sampled. So the, the BNC is the British National Corpus, the 2014 version is the most recent version of this, and uh, the design of the corpus is to represent everyday language as, as realistically as possible. So you have a spoken component in it, you have a written component in it, and you have different types of, for example, media such as newspapers or um, or, for example, academic journals and books, things like that that you would encounter in everyday life um, and that you would surround it by. And as I said, the BNC is British English. Um, so I'm taking this because the corpus is designed to represent everyday language. Um, and then I'm extracting the collocations from there um, to have them represent word connections in everyday language. So specific words of interest that have something to do with one another. Um, so I'm looking at these on the one hand, and on the other hand, I'm looking at cue response first. That's the psycholinguistic component, so the other big um, network that I will generate. These cue response pairs consist of a cue that's been given to a participant. My data set is called Swove EN. That's the English component of a massive data set. The data collection, the data set I'm using, um, consists of more than 90,000 participants giving responses to a queue. So the way this went is the people did it online. They had to fill out um, a short 
questionnaire asking them where they're from, what languages they speak, where they're based at the moment, stuff like that. So basic sociolinguistic parameters, basically. Um, and then they were presented with individual words on the screen. So just imagine the word in white here, the word true. Um, they were shown the word true and then told to type in the three words they associate with it. So just anything and they were explicitly told not to think about it too much just from spontaneously just go um, and type in those three words what do you associate with the word true um what i've shown you here is an actual example from this data set where a person has been presented with the word true and the first thing they typed is false the second thing they typed is genuine and the third thing they typed is sincere so I have a massive data set with over 12,000 different cues that have been responded to. These have been adapted as well. So um, you can introduce new cues if, if you feel that the language, you sort of when you made this list of the thousands of cues, you forgot a word that's relevant. Um, they added those on, onto it at the end. So you can look at all of these connections between the cues and the responses that those people gave. The aim here is to represent the links between elements within the mental lexicon, because this is designed to be so spontaneous. So people are just supposed to just follow their gut feeling and just type in whatever they think of. And if you look at the actual data, you can really see that some people genuinely just went with the first thought they had, um, or at least it seems like this if you, if you look at the data. So um, sometimes it's connections that aren't actually true. That's just the first intuition. They just type it in and, and um, moved on. So these two data sets is what I want to look at and visualize in massive networks. Um, yeah, so at the bottom of this is a limitation that's fairly important. And I think it's important to mention this over and over again if you work with collocations in particular. Directionality is important. Some collocation measures are not that you could find in like pre-built software online or if you just if you're not a massive statistician, you might not um, look into these too much, but it makes sense to look at whether or not what you're measuring is directional or not. So whether it measures the difference between people using white followed by house, so as in white house or house white, because some measures can sort of pull those together into one combined statistic, which might work well for some purposes, but for the psycholinguistic comparison, it really doesn't. Because there, we can argue that there's a massive difference between somebody using White House and somebody using House White with nothing between it. I don't think that's gonna appear particularly often. Um, so it's interesting, it's important to look at these differences and it's especially problematic if you have recombinations that would work both ways because then this statistic is just inflated artificially um, because it just happens to go both ways. So um, home run and run home, for example, would work, where realistically speaking, people will type out home space run sometimes if they refer to a home run. Um, and then people will probably also talk about running home. So just run home, for example. Um, and then these values would be added onto each other, which would result in this collocation to be flagged up as way more important than it actually is. Whereas words like white house don't have the chance because other, like the other way around, house white, it doesn't really work in everyday language. So um, just a reminder, this is important. And this is, a, I introduced this as a limitation because my pilot study, so what you're gonna see um, of the BNC 2014 is based on MI scores that have, not fully been corrected for this. Um, so this isn't very much um, just uh, about, I don't know, a bit over halfway through the first year of my PhD. So there's a lot of refinement going on and it's constantly being updated. So don't take any of the graphs of the um, BNC component at face value just yet. They're not finalized, but they look reasonably similar to the final result. But let me get on with actual content. What's the motivation for this? Why do we need this? Why go through all of this work? I want to reveal and examine underlying structures of these two networks. 
and I want to research non-intuitive areas of interest. So, for example, clusters in the network that I can just see if I look at them, that wouldn't have been obvious any other way. So usually when I do a study, I have an idea of what I want to talk about. For example, if I were to do a study on the representation of scientists during COVID, I know that this is my topic, right? So I'm going to actively go out and search for COVID-related terms and collocations and including COVID-related terms. And that's great and incredibly meaningful. And I'm not in any way proposing we should move away from that approach. But I also think that there's probably interesting things happening, changes going on and all that, that I wouldn't intuitively think about. So I couldn't come up with it. COVID has immediate relevance because it's it impacts our lives so much. Um, or, I don't know, stuff to do with race, ethnicity, gender, all of that, that impacts our lives massively. So there's immediate relevance to it. And we can just start an analysis based on these um, areas. But maybe there's more stuff to be discovered that's not immediately obvious. And then we're reaching the first problem. So if I want to know I don't know how specific argument structures actually work or what they look like, or get, just go on a meta level of my corpus analysis. Um, I'd normally just have to get, for example, use a collocation measure, measure all my collocations, rank them, and then I'd read through them, right? Now, if I do this with the BNC, I get, I don't know, 100,000 collocations, even after thresholds and filtering and everything. Of course, I can just set my thresholds higher, but I'm going to get a lot of results. And realistically speaking, most of the time, I only look at the top, I don't know, 20, 50, 100, maybe 200. But I'm certainly not reading this basically cover to cover. It's never happening. I'm never reading all of the results. And even more importantly, I'm never recognizing a pattern in, in these, right? If I don't read any entries from 400 to 1,000, um, I can't possibly find out any connection between them and say, oh, hey, this is this is connected to a similar word to this. Or, wow, the spelling really makes a difference in terms of semantic prosody here. If I hadn't had any intuition about it beforehand, I'm not going to discover it. So what I want to do, that was sort of the initial thought behind the PhD, is figure out a way for researchers to look at the data in a new way that works for linguists. Um, and this is how I sort of stumbled upon graph theory, because if you look at it on an abstract level, what do we work with? We work with words and we work with connections between them. And that's the same underlying system of any network. We have nodes, so that's the, the blobs. And then we have connections between them, which means that there's going to be sort of a, a, a web generated around those. Um, so I thought maybe let's let's look at language like this and just see if there's anything particular about the shape um, that we get or about the connectivity of certain words. Maybe there's interesting findings there. So that was sort of the initial um, stage. Uh, what, what, and this is what motivates me. And then the mental lexicon component was really interesting to me as well. Because just looking at these Q response pairs, if I read through them again, I'm going to read through what the top 10, 15, 20, 100, 200, maybe, but I won't read through all of them. And that doesn't mean that something on position 200 isn't interesting, or for example, a cluster or a system at position 200 isn't interesting. So um, it's a, uh, I thought, well, maybe let's look at mental lexicon data um, and then let's look at corpus data and contrast them and see how these patterns that emerge actually work and then compare them and see how, how that goes. So that's sort of the basic underlying idea. Another limitation, and I just want to highlight it and I'll probably highlight it again and again. Um, when I talk about networks in the mental lexicon, that doesn't mean that I necessarily follow the idea that we have a word stored in one particular spot in our brain and that's physically like a neuron connected to another spot in the brain and there's just like a simple connection like this so I'm not proposing we have an actual network in our brain 
I'm just saying in terms of the way people come up with words, there are connections between these words and systematic mentions that appear over and over again. And these are connected like a network. That doesn't mean this physically in our head. Um, so I, I hope I, I'm just trying to make this clear because it's always very hard to talk about this when people immediately have the conceptualization of neural networks going on in our brain and all that. Um, but this isn't what I'm researching um, and I couldn't do it without being a neurologist, which I'm not. Um, all right, so let's get to it. What can we do already? Why do I have to smash out yet another thing? So at the end of the PhD, hopefully, I will have produced a tool which other people can use where they can load in a corpus, for example, create a network on the basis of this and then analyze it. Why do we need this? Has anyone done it before? There's so many corpus tools out there. There's so many different methodologies going on already. Why add another thing to it? Some of you might be familiar with Langsbox and GraphCall in Langsbox, where you can get graphs like this, which are brilliant. Um, so this actually exists to a degree. What doesn't exist is a corpus-wide collocation network, so a massive one. What you can see here is White House in the BNC 2014 Baby Plus. This is just a screenshot out of Lang's box with a filter on so you don't see every single word and you can actually kind of read it. This is brilliant. It's efficient, it's dynamic, it, it's just, it works, it's robust, it's really nice. It does rely on me giving it the word White House or the connection or just in typing in white or house and then looking at these words and, and actually expanding what I'm interested in. So it does rely on initial intuition, which is what I want to move away from. This is why I need a new approach. So it's kind of, it's brilliant for if you have a, something you want to research, it's just pre-built, you can just start it today um, and get it done, but it's not infinitely customizable. It's not designed for what I want to use it for. And I looked around a bit and I found that nothing out there is really designed for what I'm trying to do. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to do it myself um which is what i'm currently doing so this is me taking a look at large-scale corpus wide networks you can see the logos for some of the tools that you can use or just um environments you can use to work with this um it's giphy and cytoscape my visualizations that you're going to see in this presentation are based on cytoscape but there's also other libraries going on like jgraph.t or sigma.js um, where you can do really nice dynamic visualizations you can go a step further and go 3D. Um, some people do VR representations of networks. So all of that is really cool um, and interesting, but it's very resource intensive. So you can't just click go somewhere and it's going to produce something. So that's a bit of a problem if you actually want to analyze your data from the like the go from go. And then it's not as readily available as for linguists. So you can open Cytoscape and import a network and Cytoscape is mainly built for biologists and they have pre-built networks uploaded there and all of that. And it's brilliant. The visualizations are really nice and it works for linguistics, but you have to tweak the parameters pretty heavily and you have to do all the pre-processing of the data yourself. So all of the frequencies for the collocations, all of that technical stuff, you need to actually do all of this yourself. So um it's a bit more effort but what the payoff is, payout is of this is that it allows us to look at structural properties of the networks properly so for example in Langsbox, if i look at white house this is interesting if i'm just interested in white house but maybe i'm interested in what's actually surrounding the word house in general but on a larger le scale level so where is house located in the entire network in the entire corpus so does it have a specific position is it under a lot of strain do a lot of other nodes interact with it or do they not and then what happens to for example prices is prices also connected to something that is connected to white and so as soon as you go these steps deeper you need a network that can sort of take in the entire corpus so that's what i'm trying to do um, 
what's the rationale behind this in terms of the psycholinguistic component? What's the theory behind this? And this is sort of the foundation for what I'm working on and a bit of the psycholinguistic validity of it as well, because so far it sounds like I just dreamed all that up. Um, I'm following a constructionist approach here, which means that effective communication relies on abstractions, um, certain predictions and inferences. So let's say, for example, I'm talking to my flatmate and I want to talk about an apple, but I don't actually say apple. Let's say I, I, I say, did you have the fruit today? Meaning the apple. Um, so in my brain, there's the apple. I think about it, but I do say fruit. My flatmate hears me and maybe that the flatmate is a bit of a weird character. And to them, the prototypical fruit is a tomato, which is a very weird prototypical fruit to have. But just for the sake of the argument, imagine this would be happening. Communication just wouldn't work and we would fail to to come to an agreement. So I, there's some way in which I need to adjust this so we can understand each other. And what you can observe in these scenarios is that people have categories that are sort of commonly understood as meaning something. So for example, if I say fruit, people are more likely to imagine an apple than probably a tomato, at least around here. And then if I say fruit in the context I've described to you, where we have previously had a conversation about the flatmate having the apple, um, and I said, did you have the fruit today? That clearly means it has to have some connection to that conversation. And chances are the flatmate's going to think about the apple, actually. So what happens in the back of our mind there, over time when we socialize, when we grow up, is we get certain signals and we look at we can that's research that's been done we can look at the frequencies of occurrence of these so how often does somebody say fruit and mean apple and if this happens more than any other fruit chances are your prototypical fruit is going to be an apple it's not that simple it's not just raw frequency but a large part of it is um and this obviously links in with the frequency of co-occurrence approach so how often these things co-occur or occur in the same meaning context or in the same sentence has an impact on how we perceive, how we process, chunk and store linguistic information. So that all of this is based on psycholinguistic research. I've given you a few references there if you're interested in it, um, where you can do experiments and see that the frequency of occurrence actually changes behavior. So you can recode it. If I continue calling tomatoes fruit all the time um, and talk to my flatmate about it in this way all the time, chances are we might both update our, our understanding of what fruit is or prototypical fruit is, and then we can communicate again. Um, so the basic principles of this approach, the constructionist approach are that there's a lexical grammatical continuum. There's no such thing as a hard border between lexes and grammar which is also why I include lexical and grammatical items in my collocation definition. Um, that language learning is not biologically predetermined, so it's not hard coded into my brain that fruit, like the sound fruit, means probably apple. Um, but that's something I learn. So if I learn another language, this information won't be there. If I grew up a Japanese, um, a, a, a NL1 speaker of Japanese, I probably wouldn't associate fruit with apple because that's not biologically determined. There's no commonality there. It's not, I'm not born with this. And the third one, which is probably the least transparent one, is that linguistic knowledge is emergent. What this is supposed to mean is it's ever changing due to new situations of use. That's sort of the tomato scenario I presented. So my learning process, in essence, depends on how distinctive a word is, how recently I've heard about this, how reliable it is. So if every time someone says fruit, they mean apple, it's going to be considered very reliable and what the context looks like. And I try with more sophisticated association measures and all that to filter my collocations to fit this, these descriptions. To, so to actually look out for properties like distinctiveness, recency, reliability, stuff like that, um, which would then allow me to sort of generate a network just based on what we perceive all the time, um, that might explain why me calling an apple just a fruit 
might work in this situation actually and we might be thinking about the same thing at the end so this is the part um uh, well this is sort of the component of the psycholinguist rea reality of this all and why this study isn't completely invalid from the go all right graph theoretical parameters this is a table you don't have to worry about too much don't even bother reading it if you're not interested in it and um, this is going to be uploaded as a um a video on youtube so if you are interested in it just go ahead and read all these definitions i put those together it's not complete but it's sort of a little cheat sheet for graph theoretical parameters um that i put together we're going to be looking for the purpose of this just three of them and i'll explain what they actually mean just so you can understand sort of the basics of what i'm doing most of the other measures are a bit more complex than the three i will present but um I thought I'd give you a little indi indication as to how I actually identify these structures I keep talking about. All right, so here we go. The first one I want to talk about is characteristic path length. What you see here is three times the same network. I just gave the nodes numbers instead of collocation like word names. You can imagine for the purpose of this that this is actual words connected, but I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. And as you can see, it's three times the same thing. The only thing that's different is the colors. This is because these are colored based on properties of the individual nodes. So remember, a dot is a node and a line is an edge. That's just basic terminology of this. We can look at something called characteristic path length. Um, that means the average length of a path from a certain node to any other node. So for the sake of this, let's look at the node number nine. So the path length between nine and six is two because I have to walk alongside, like along two lines, right? So I have to, I can only go to six. The shortest way between nine and six is via two. I could of course also go nine, one, eight, three, eight, five, seven, two, six, if I wanted to, but we're interested in shortest path because we're interested in shortest connections between words. So what's the most immediate thing that connects one word to another to yet another? Um, this is what characteristic path length is about. So I arrive at this value, 1.88, by looking at every single node that nine is connected to. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 10. And for every single one of those, I look at how far do I need to go if I take the shortest, most efficient path. And I average those. This is 1.88 in this network. Mm. Why is this important to linguists? Like, why would I be doing this? This is important because I can measure what the shortest distance between this word to any other network in my corpus is. So I can assign every single word a value. And then I'm going to find out that some of these words are more central than others. This is where closeness centrality comes in. This is literally built on the path length. So it's the value you see here, it's just one divided by the path length. So you have a nice scale from, from zero to one. If you look at number nine, you can see that this is medium type kind of thing, 0.5. Um, here you can, on the top, you can see the scale. So the, the closeness centrality, which is what we call this, um, sort of determines how efficient information can flow. So if I took the shortest possible steps between concepts, um, so for example, if my thinking were maximally efficient, and I look at the Q response pairs I've collected, I could just walk through them, like rush through them, um, and see that the closest, like the most immediate connection is through this, through that, and so on and so forth. So these sort of show me how central um, these individual words are. And here we can see that five is, is the most central because it has the shortest connections to everywhere else. It just sits in a very convenient spot in the network. The other one I want to talk about is between the centrality. It looks similar, but it measures something slightly different. This measures how important the node is to the rest of the network. So in effect, this measures what would happen if I would forget this word, right? 
how would the other words still be connected or would they or would the network just break apart um, sometimes you have words in a context where um, in the context of a specific topic if you leave one word out that connected all of the rest it actually fractures and breaks and it's two separate issues that are only connected through one word. This is what, what's measured by between the centrality. They look similar, but look at the node seven for a moment. Seven here in closeness centrality is relatively dark, which means, or relatively red, which means that um, it is closely connected to most of the other nodes. Um, so in this way, it's very efficient. It's, it's important for quick information um flow here you can see that it's much lighter um because the between the centrality isn't that high and this is because almost everything that's connected to seven is also any connected to each other anyway so if i remove seven out of this network two and ten are still connected whereas if i remove five out of this network it's going to take ages to get from six to one because there's no more direct connection. There's no more convenient connection there. Um, so in a way, this signifies that seven is important for quick information transfer, but not very important for the network overall. So if you remove it, the network kind of looks the same. So that's the fact basics. That's sort of the foundations. There's more sophisticated measures, of course, um, but there's pretty cool things you can do with those alone in terms of linguistics. and. My research is a bit of basic research and stuff that hasn't been done before a lot. Um, so what I really want to do at the end of the PhD is provide people with new ways at look, for looking at data, looking at texts, um, and with new ways to analyze those. So maybe if you're interested in how people talk about a topic, it might be interesting to see what terms you could remove from your network. Um, that would still keep the topic intact and what terms you could remove and then you get like two separate meanings out of this. This leads me to the applications bit. I'm going to be very quick here. What you can look at, um, so this is just a list of things I've identified where people currently use collocation successfully, where you could optimize their approach or sort of help with what they're doing or at least offer a new perspective uh, as to what they've done using these network approaches. So just looking at it in terms of connections rather than raw data. Um, that's language pedagogy. Um, for example, if you look at translation studies and all that, where you have very fine meaning differences, you can look at where in the network this lies and if it lies next to something relevant, for example, and then determine if this is um, a better translation or a worse one just based on the network. Mm, you can do meta-level structural analysis. These are, for example, the, the um, Chen study is something that looks at how does language change over centuries. So that was a study, a, a diachronic study into Chinese. And then you can draw a massive network and look at how does the shape of the network change, um, these kinds of things. Similarly with phrase extraction, that's kind of what I've explained already, where you can break these networks apart uh, and look at which phrases stick together the closest. Meaning dis disambiguation also related forensic linguistics, where you could, in theory, build profiles on the basis of these collocational networks. Um, as always with forensic linguistics, the most important bit is to be incredibly, incredibly cautious about what you're doing and to only do it if you're in very competent and understand the statistical implications of what you're doing very well. So this is sort of a prototype. It's just it's a thought that might work. Um, and you need a lot of collaboration, but it might help people visualize these sort of patterns in text a bit better. You can use it for language development. Um, there's a few NLP related application areas that have sort of been exploited already, word sense induction and that kind of thing. And then there's non-academic applications for, for example, for search engine optimization. So what appears at the top of your page at Google and how relevant this is, you could use networks to determine this or refine how this is determined. And for diagnosis in cl clinical psychology, for example, by just looking at which words do people actually forget in practice and how is this gonna affect their language? So if you look at, mm, I don't know, diseases that sort of impact your linguistic abilities that might be interesting or just general memory loss and then people struggling with these terms. So you could look at these networks and sort of model what would happen, um, which might 
help us understand better what's going on there. And this is really what this PhD is about. It's very, it's a bit of a different approach to many other PhDs and it's a bit of a, a stretch sometimes to sort of squeeze it into the thesis, but it's designed to produce something, a new tool for people and a new way of looking at data really. So um, if anyone is interested in any of those particular applications, do let me know. I'm gonna show you two case studies and I'll be very quick. This is genre effects in the BNC 2014 Baby Plus. These are the first two networks that I've generated that you can see. As I said, bear in mind, it's not perfect yet because the MI scores are not perfectly balanced yet in terms of directionality and all that. Generally speaking, the networks do look like this. Um, the color is mapped to between the centrality. So how important is this node for a network? If I remove it, how much does it impact the shape of the network? The darker, the more important. You can see you have a center and a periphery in both of them, and they look reasonably similar. At a, at a certain size, all of your networks are gonna look like hairballs. This is what they are sometimes referred to, but you can see a, a little difference. The academic book section has a weird area here. If you just look at it right there, you have sort of, you have a bit of blue very far out. So a bit of nodes that are very important, very far out. And you have sort of a blob there. It's not perfectly round. I'd expect this to be cut off somehow. So I thought, well, let's zoom into this and look what's going on there. So the left is academic books and the right is academic journals. Great. So I thought, well, let's zoom in, filter a bit, filter all the yellow stuff out. That's just words that occur that are just connected to one other word or something or where there's not massive significance. Just look at the words and see what's going on there. And this illustrates why I think this approach has meaning behind it. I wouldn't have come up with this by just looking at the graph, uh, just, sorry, just looking at the table and reading the, uh, the values out. I wouldn't have seen, well, well, there's a few words connected in a weird way there if I just read the numbers. I have to actually look at it and see what's going on. So let's zoom in. This is what happens. So this is the section you see here, just the blue bits. Um, the yellow filtered out so you can read it. I thought, okay, academic books, let's see what's going on there. <laughs> we see, just first glance, this is biology, something to do with this, something natural science-y, very specific terms. Um, but they're interconnected very heavily and they seem to be important for like relying on one another a lot. What's going on there? Why do we have this here? And more importantly, why is it out there? Why is it not in the middle where everyone else, is, like where everything else important is? If this is connected to more than one topic, why isn't it somewhere more central? Um, and I found that this shape is an effect of something genre specific to the books that doesn't occur in the journals. This is a result of massive lists of just bullet points. So. You just have bullet points specifying specific features of biological um, entities here. And you find that there's almost no grammar in the bullet points, of course, because there's no full sentences. It's just a picture of, I don't know, uh, I think it's fungi or something. And it's a picture of this, and then a description in bullet point style. And this is what shifted this outside of the network because these things aren't actually connected to the center here. They're not connected to all of the grammatical items in the middle anymore. They're sort of outliers out there. Um, so I basically found a structural difference in my network that I wouldn't have found based on intuition alone. So that's sort of, I know this isn't the most exciting finding in the world, um, but bear with me, please. It's just a pilot study. Um, the next one is hopefully going to be a bit more interesting, but this illustrates very well why this approach changes the way we see things. Um, this is just the numbers again. I just put it in here for reference. If you're interested in reading this, you can see what, how the clustering coefficients, for example, differ um, for these networks. But I just put this in here for reference only, basically. Case study two, I'm going to be very quick. Um, so we can get to questions as well. It's a comparison between the BNC and um, 
the psycholinguistic network. I took an example word, so I went against my um, idea of not having any intuition whatsoever affect it, but I just wanted to see how it works out and how these two specifically compare. The positions of the other words are still determined by the rest of the network. You can't read this, this is normal, you, you're not supposed to, There's, I couldn't fit the high resolution images in this. In the actual PhD, in the presentation, this is going to be um, published online so you can zoom in and out and look at all of these words. Just, you're going to take me at, at my word for this here, the middle node is scientist and the red dots are things that occur in both networks. The rest is unique words, so we can see that the B and C and my psycholinguistic Q response data set look pretty different. There's not a, a lot of overlap here. And you can see that the shape is very different as well. Um, so what you can compare then is the structural properties of this. It looks somewhat like this. So you have the tables again. You can see how many connections are there, like how many words are there, and then how many connections do we have. One interesting thing, for example, that I found with this study, and I'm, as I said, just for brevity, I'm going to keep it very short, is that the average number of neighbors for the psycholinguistic network is a lot higher. So we have a lot of interconnections between every single one of these words. You can see that this is more of a spider web and this is more of a blob. Um, that's because all of these words are have specific relations to one another. Whereas in the from the B and C alone, we wouldn't know this. So we can sort of argue that there's a bit more richness surrounding the term scientist in in these collective 90,000 people's minds about what, what does scientists really mean. Whereas in the BNC, you get sort of a clearer picture um, of connections and areas that are connected, but it's not as complex and interwoven as um, our psycholinguistic network. But yeah, there's, of course, more that we could talk about here. And if you're interested in anything in particular, I'm very happy to do that. But for now, I'm going to conclude um, with the observations that statistical probabilities of collocations in the BNC, so the language we're surrounded by and exposed to, that's sort of what I'm trying to use the BNC for, actually impact our mental lexicon and vice versa. This is sort of an eternal circle of like, I use a word and other people hear it and then they use it and then I think about the word differently and so on and so forth. So it's just a, a cycle that goes on forever. And collocation networks and cue association networks can help us investigate these similarities and differences in a meaningful way that's non-intuitive. So that's what I'm trying to do and say here really. What I'm going to do next is work on the efficiency and on getting my MI scores to work and then a full remodeling of the association measures I use in the workflow and everything. Then I'm going to refine the parameters and everything as, a bit. So fine tuning, working on the actual visualization, how do I plot it, all that. I will compare the resulting networks. And then if I have spare time, hopefully, I get to do nice alternative visualizations, hive plots and the like, 3D uh, uh, visualizations of the dynamic models, all of that. But this is the very distant future. Um, for now, I've, I've sort of given you hopefully a bit of an insight as to what I'm actually working with and, and how this went. So all I've left is my references and hopefully your questions. So if you have any questions, anything you're interested in, let me know. Thank you, Thank very, you much, very much, Hannah. Hannah. I will, I will just, just stop the recording. Stop the recording.